Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to our weekly Family Connections. I'm Rachel McLean, an Assistant Superintendent with Snyder ISD, and we have several panelists joining us today from our high school campus as we talk about uh, plans for the spring at the high school. So, um, as usual, we have Valerie Morris, our Public Information Officer with us, and Jesus Gomez, our Equity Director, uh, if anyone's needing language supports please reach out to Jesus and he will be able to support you. And then all in one room together, we have our other panelists. Um, we have Travis Gregory and David Tate, our assistant principals. Uh, Shauna Pinkerton is our academic dean. And then Shay Murphy is our high school principal. So we have lots of questions and we are going to get started. If you have questions while we're talking uh, through today, if you will please pop those in the chat or add those into the Q&A feature. We'll try to add, uh, answer as many of those online as possible um, as we are going through today. But we've had some submitted in advance and some other questions that we've had uh, coming up on the other campuses. So we think that high school parents may want to know that also. So uh, you guys ready? Okay. <laughs> um, so first of all, just what changes, if anything, uh, can parents and students expect to see on the high school campus this spring semester? Okay, um, what changes? Well, first of all, we... If someone's talking, I think you're on mute. Can y'all hear it? Nope. Try that again, I'm so sorry. Shay, were you talking? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I can, I can hear you better if I turn my volume all the way up, so maybe um, just speak loudly. Yes, that's better. Okay, good deal. Um, well, I, I think first of all, we've uh, we started bringing a, a lot of our students back, so we we have less that are virtual right now. Uh, I think we're down to less than ten percent of our students that are virtual at the high school. So um, that's been a good thing for us. We've got more students on campus. Uh, it's easier to kind of manage them and make sure that uh, learning's taking place. So that I think with some of the changes. You know, across the state that are happening with uh, COVID guidelines and everything, you know, we're starting to really look into um, what things are going to look like for us for the rest of the year with things like um, graduation, prom, if that's a possibility and things like that. You know, we've been real hesitant to say a whole lot about those things because we don't know what it's going to look like yet. So uh, we're looking at those options. Um, as far as other changes, I mean, the spring is just crazy busy at the high school. I mean, we have five or six sports going on, one act play, choir just finished up a lot of things, uh, so many things going on. So just uh, keeping up with students, you know, having students uh, in different places um, throughout the school day, you know, at tournaments and things like that, it's um, kind of gets busy and wild for a teacher keeping track of those students. So those are just some of the things that are going on. Uh, it's busy. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we're looking forward to getting back to what normal school would look like, uh, where we can have more of our events, traditional events, such as prom and stuff. So, okay. Kind of Sounds fun. Sounds like it was a fast-paced ride till the middle of June. So um, we've had some questions coming in about attendance. Um, at the high school level, uh, what, what happens if a child misses too many classes during the school day, and then what options are in place um, for students still to still retain their credit. Okay, um, I'll answer that one too. I mean, they can chime in and see if I miss anything. But uh, you know, we have to follow Texas compulsory attendance law, so students have to be in in uh, in attendance ninety percent of the time, and that's for both face to face and virtual students. Um, and, and attendance has been difficult uh, with all the you know going back and forth and virtual and different things. So we've made a lot of adjustments, but uh, for the students that aren't present ninety percent of the time. Uh, they have different options of making up that time. Uh, so we've already put that into place. We've contacted all those parents and students and um, they're doing things such as Saturday school, uh, Pride Hall. Uh, we've done, you know, for our virtual students and, and students that owe quite a bit of hours, we've added options as far as um, lessons and, and uh, reviews and things like that through Ingenuity where they can make up time that way. Um, so those are some options for make up time, but they have to make up time and still have the passing grade in the class to earn that credit. Um, you know, no matter what's going on with COVID and, and everything, we have to follow uh, 
Texas compulsory attendance laws and, and uh, meet the, the requirement, the attendance requirements and passing the class. So um, it's busy and we have a lot going on with that, but uh, students are, for those coming through for us, we have a lot of them that are attending Saturday school and already completing their ingenuity. So we're getting close to having all of our students um, pass or earn their credit. For their credit, for based off of attendance, good. Um, so, talking about academics and kind of finishing the year strong. Obviously, you can't earn credit on a class that maybe you're not passing in. So, how what should parents be doing um, to support their students? Like, what should a student be doing each day, maybe in class and at home? And then, what are some things that parents might can do if they see their student is struggling? Okay, I think we all want to chime in on this one. I think really um, the main thing is students show up every day to class and, and they come prepared and that they, um, you know, focus. And on the flip side of that, um, us as educators got to show up every day prepared and, and ready to teach and lessons. And, and then we just got to manage everything, making sure students are, are challenged on task, uh, that we're grading things in a timely manner, giving them feedback. Um, and then when students are struggling uh, that we support them and find out and we support their help. Uh, students need to, and parents need to help keep track of grades. And then when they're falling behind, make sure they're asking questions uh, to their teachers or come to one of us for help and support. Uh, we can direct them, you know, in the right direction to get help. We can put them in things like prize hall. Um, there's also times before and after school or during the day that we can get some extra support in the classroom. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things that's the easiest for a parent to do to make sure their students are staying up with their work is in Schoology, which is where um, all the work is located, uh, at the top of your student's Schoology area, there is a place called Grade Report. That grade report lists every single class that they have. It is the easiest for me with my own personal kids uh, as we end the six weeks um, for, for my children. I go straight to that grade report. We click on every single class and we look at all the assignments. We make sure we see uh, either a grade, a real grade, not a zero. Zero should probably be questioned and, and visit with your teacher about that. Or a little piece of paper, that little uh, paper icon will show that they've submitted something. Um, so that at least tells you as a parent that your student has turned something in, now the teacher has to get it graded and into Schoology. Uh, when in doubt, always email your, your teacher. Uh, if that doesn't, if that's not seemingly, you know, uh, taking care of the problem, always never hesitate to email me and I will do my best to try to get that correspondence uh, cleared up and taken care of. But that's what I do with my own personal kids. And that's what I tell every single student that comes to me. That grade report tab tells you exactly what you need and or missing from the class uh, before the six weeks is over this time. And then the, um, the official grade book is sitting in Skyward, but that's the Schoology is the, a great place to monitor how things are going. Is that what you're saying? Yes, correct. The, the Schoology allows you to go straight to that assignment and take care of that work if it hasn't been turned in. But at the end of the day, Skyward is the grade, official grade report. If there are zeros in place or a discrepancy that they're seeing, that should be questioned with the teacher. But Skyward will tell you the average the grade that your student has in that class. It will also tell you missing assignments as well. Um, however, Schoology in that grade report tab is easiest to go straight to the assignment. Okay. And I think I see where Valerie popped into the chat. The, uh, it was a previous Family Connections where um, we had instructions on how parents could access their Schoology and, and see the grades. And so that's a great uh, fam previous family connection to check out if you have questions on Schoology. Um, I may have missed it. Did, did you guys talk about Pride Hall and the times that students could come and get some assistance? No, ma'am. Um, one of the questions was, uh, my student is struggling, what resources are available? We encourage all students to start with, the, with their own teacher because a lot of our teachers are staying after school to help their students individually one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but if that's not a possibility, we do offer Pride Hall Monday through Thursday. Uh, Monday and Wednesday is from four to five, and Tuesday and Thursday is 6.30 to 7.30. And we try to make sure that we all, always have a one core teacher. 
or one teacher from each course subject is what we try to make sure we have that by fall. Okay. So that's an awesome resource for additional support too. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about testing. Um, we will still have the STAR test in the spring. Um, and so why is it important for our, um, our students to participate in the STAR? And do we still have the requirements to pass the EOCs, the end of course test, um, as we have had in, in, in the past? Yes, I think there's some false information out there based on kind of what happened last spring that uh, the state kind of waived the STAR test and canceled that. That's not the case this year. Uh, students are held accountable for passing the STAR test, especially the high school and of course exams. That is part of their graduation requirement that they'll have to complete uh, and pass the five tests at high school uh, for STAR to, to graduate. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're taking those classes seriously, all classes really, but of course the, the STAR tested subjects, uh, that test is there as part of a graduation requirement, just like the credits are. And it's important that they do their best on that. Okay, so in, for everything under high school, uh, you may have heard the high stakes part of, you know, the STAR has been removed and we're still gonna be administering the STAR, you know, for all of our grade levels, three through eight and high school. Um, but what has not been removed is the requirement for our kids to have um, their end of course test passed prior to graduation, except, I know this gets so confusing, if a child was in US history last year and they passed that class and they're a senior now, that one test is, is no longer a requirement. And that was this, the waiver that Mr. Gregory's re referring to is the state did that last year during the COVID shutdown, but that is not the case this year. So all of our freshmen should be ready to do English one, algebra one, sophomores and, and freshmen biology and English two, and then our uh, juniors should be ready to do U.S. history. Is that correct? Yes, and anyone who has uh, already that has struggled with the test and hadn't passed prior to last spring, uh, they're still needing to meet that same requirement. They still need to retest at every opportunity uh, and try to pass uh, to meet that requirement as well. So right. any juniors that are that are still trying to pass tests, they have one more opportunity before their graduation date this spring to take care of that. Okay, very good. So if a parent, I know that gets all confusing, if a parent has a question, should they just reach out to you, Mr. Gregory, as the testing coordinator? Or? Yes, they can call me and I can explain the whole process. I can look at each student and uh, talk through what tests they need and, and what resources are available and things like that. Okay. Um, what about individual graduation committees? So some there's some uh, parents that may have had some communication uh, regarding that. So what is an IGC? What is that? Okay, so IGC is the Individual Graduation Committee and uh, that's for seniors uh, that they're looking at different things that they may not have uh, completed prior to their senior year. For example, I mentioned seniors that haven't yet passed all of their STAR tests. A committee will meet to discuss that student status with a STAR test and look at the big picture of things with their credits, attendance, the STAR test, what can be done to help them meet all of their requirements for graduation. Okay. All right, and but parents that would be involved with the IGC, they'll have direct contact by the, from the school. Yes, and we're working on that soon to be reaching out to them to set up some meetings to go over the whole process and, and uh, we'll try to include them um, every step of the way just so they know what's going on. Okay. So we introduced a new thing this year, MAP testing. Um, so different than the STAR testing. So what is MAP? Um, how, can how can parents know um, how their student has performed on MAP? And are, how's the, how is the school using those MAP scores currently? All right, so I'm sure people have heard of benchmark testing, things like that before. The MAP test is just like that. It's a benchmark test and we do that three times of the year to track student progress. Uh, the company for that map, the NWEA, they do a lot of research that ties to uh, predictions of how students may perform on STAR tests and things like that. And so we're really using that data to look closely at students' pr progress throughout the year. Uh, and we're using that to uh, provide interventions to students that may struggle in the area or to, to kind of change what they're teaching the classroom. If they need to go over some concepts a little more in depth, if the whole class is struggling, or they can assign specific tutorials and things like that to help students be more successful. 
based on the map data. Uh, teachers can send that information out to parents. Parents can contact teachers directly to get some help on that. There's uh, several reports available, a family report that goes over students' uh, progress from one map to another. It shows the growth and it shows what uh, comparison data is from the state and from the nation. Even. Uh, so you can see how your student kind of measures up. And mo that's just in math and English. Math and, and English, yes ma'am. Math, math and English. Uh, we've had a question come in, um, a couple of questions actually. Uh, one is how can parents access Skyward? Um, and so we, I know we've had a previous Family Connections, but if a parent is wanting to get their Skyward access, who's the best person to contact on the campus? The counselor's office. Okay. Uh, they can get them their username and password if they don't already have that. Um, students all have access to it and they should know their login information without a problem. Um, but parent access, the easiest person to contact would be our uh, counseling office here and they can get them the information for their username and password. Okay, and it's a great thing to have that parent access. You can see their grades, their attendance, um, register online when we register back in the fall. <laughs> so, um, all right, uh, Shauna, this wasn't on our list, but it popped in my mind. Uh, TSI testing, that's the other type of testing that we do on the campus quite a bit. Why do we do TSI testing? And um, it's had a little bit of a change in the last few weeks. So do you wanna say anything about that? It sure has, it's been my life for the last few weeks. So uh, TSI testing, uh, TSIA 2.0, uh, it's a Texas initiative to help all students become college ready. Um, and for, for our purposes, we utilize this test for a couple of reasons. Uh, all of our seniors, and we have had great success and also feedback from our graduating seniors. Um, all of our seniors take the TSI. Uh, if they are not successful, we work through a TSI prep class to try to help them uh, get become more successful or even get the test passed. That's our ultimate goal, obviously. Once that test is taken, they never have to worry about it for five years. So if life changes, even if they don't plan on going to college right out of high school, uh, life changes, that test is still taken and out of their way. They don't have to worry about it. And maybe in a year or so after high school, they decide to maybe go out to WTC um, and, and enter that college and that, that TSI score is sitting right there waiting for them. We've actually had quite a few seniors that took the TSI, passed it in high school. They did not go to WTC right out of college, but now they're starting the spring semester. I've had a rash of requesting TSI scores all of a sudden. And so, uh, right before the spring semester started and then i think we'll see that happen again in the fall that's usually what happens they get a year into the adult working and they decide well maybe i should do something different uh, so that's one way we use the tsi another way we use the tsi is for our dual credit program there are certain courses that require um, passing of certain parts of the tsi so we have to uh, administer that and then help those students study there's been quite a few changes they actually have their own study guide built into the TSI now, so that's actually quite helpful. Um, but uh, we're still adjusting to the new changes of the test that happened January the 11th um, and helping our students be successful on that test. So we're going in the right direction. It's just taking us a little bit uh, to get there, but that is the gist of the TSI. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. All right. Um, so let's talk about, um, what's happening right now with course registration and getting ready for next year. So uh, we may have some junior high, eighth grade parents on the, on the call also. Um, so let's talk about what's happening with the eighth graders coming in for ninth grade and then what happens with our current students. So how, do they, how are students selecting their classes and um, how do parents get involved with that whole process? So kind of where we are in the process right now is our counselors are actually going to the junior high visiting with the incoming freshmen during their win period. Um, and so they're having that individual conversation. We've already been to the junior high and spoke holistically to the eighth grade. We've invited them through a Zoom to see all of our different programs uh, that we have available. Um, and so now it's individual conversations with their students actually getting their course selections put into Skyward. Uh, we actually have a parent meeting tonight at 6.30 in the cafeteria to help facilitate some of this registration. So if anybody is interested in coming to that, 
for the incoming freshmen will be here at the cafeteria, uh, the counselors, myself, uh, several, that, several people that can help them get their course selections completed. That is happening tonight and Thursday night. So if that's any way that can be helpful to parents, please come on and let's see if we can get those questions answered. Um, but currently, that's what we're working on with incoming freshmen. The rest of the time, not during win period at the junior high, the counselors are meeting with your students that will be incoming 10 through 12th grade through their classes here at the high school. And they're individually having that conversation with them uh, to ensure that they've got the correct courses selected for us to create the schedule. And so parents um, that want to be involved in that process, we have one uh, parent, you know, want to know if, if there'll be schedule meetings between parents and students, not eighth graders, not incoming eighth graders, up, upperclassmen, um, to go over class schedules. So how, how does a parent get involved with that process if they want to for their incoming 10th through 12th graders? So currently our counselors are divided. Um, Ms. Beaver, Emily Beaver, that takes care of the current 9th and 11th grade students. And Chrissy Early takes care of the 10th and the 11th grade students. I mean, 12th, 10th and then 12th grade, thank you. Um, but if, so if you have a 9th or a, a 11th grade student, contact Emily Beaver. And if you have a 10th or 12th grade student, contact Chrissy Early. And I believe that would be the easiest way to become involved in that process to help your students select the correct course. And then parents also see a, like a personal graduation plan, correct? Sure, yes. Okay, uh, and that is available? Through Ms. Early in the counselor's office. Okay, always through the counselors. Counsel contact the counselor's office. Okay, good deal. Um, so we've had a question come in about any college classes that are being offered during the summer. Um, if that's a... That's an exciting question, actually. <laughs> Somebody wants to go to school in the summer at college. Um, so what are what should parents and students do? So I meet with every single student that's currently taking dual credit classes before the summer to let them know if there's any classes they should take during the summer to maybe catch them up in their program, uh, different reasons that they would take that. Uh, between the junior and the senior year, there's generally a class, one class that they have to take during the summer to keep them on track to get their associates if that's their goal. Um, so, so there's those reasons that I would visit with them. If it's an individual student that has not started dual credit, um, I would encourage them to come to the queue in my office and visit with me so we can make sure they get their application um, done in a timely manner so that they can take college classes. The next thing that we would discuss is which college class it is that they would like to take for the summer. Um, our summer classes are not dual credit. So they, what, what you take in the summer does not uh, give you high school credit for that. So that is not something that we tend to do for summer courses. They're not actually dual credit. That happens during the school year. Um, and there are certain dual credit courses, even during the school year, they are not dual credit. It's very few and it's usually <coughs> elective type courses. So I usually have that conversation with the student to make sure they understand which courses are which. Uh, but I would most definitely encourage them to come visit for, and the parent as well, if they would like to be a part of that conversation. And let's make sure we have the correct paperwork done to enroll them. If they're already enrolled and taking dual credit classes right now, that's pretty easy. I will help them get enrolled in the correct class for the summer without a problem. Okay, very good. And if that's new, I guess those deadlines are coming up pretty soon since this is March, right? Yes, we'll, we'll have the, those deadlines are probably in May. I don't have that date on right. my head. Um, but they're probably in May for new registration. But hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and get it taken care of. They'll take That's care. right. Don't wait to the last minute. You don't like to do that. <laughs> no. Um, all right. Our last topic that we have to talk about um, is summer programs. So school ends on June 11th. Do you have your date set for summer programs yet? Or is that still a kind of a work in progress? Uh, that's a work in progress. But the, the ending June 11th, I'm, I assume we're just going to roll right into it. Just, just more school. <laughs> okay. I know um, we've talked with our elementary campuses um, a couple weeks ago and our summer programs there starting June 14th and, and running all the way through the end of July, which sounds like a long time, but um, if we have any elementary parents that are on the call that also have high school students. Um, we're trying to do that more in a summer camp format 
kind of a fun but educational camp format. That's not necessarily the format for high school. So why would kids, apart from the college students that are taking some summer classes for working on their associates, why would other students need to attend summer school? That's going to be for a variety of students. If uh, a student failed uh, their math class, and that's the only class they failed, rather than taking two math classes the next year, they might be reassigned the one they failed during summer school. Also, you run into students that are behind on credits. Uh, it may be their second year here on campus, but to regain their class, uh, class grade classification, they may ass be assigned multiple classes. It may be for students that want to free up a spot um, in their next year's schedule. So we offer summer school for a variety of different reasons. Some is just to regain certain credits, some are to regain their classification, and some are just to free up enough room in next year's schedule to where they can take the courses they would, they would want to take. So when you say classification, just I, I know this is always um, kind of a little confusing when we move from the lower campuses to a high school campus. So things get more important at the, not that they weren't important at our lower grades, but um, you, we graduate students based off of a number of credits earned and a very specific type of credits, right? And so when a student doesn't earn, say three or four math credits, what happens? They, they, don't, they won't graduate. They don't graduate, right? And so um, when you're saying classification, you're talking about like freshman, to sophomore, sophomore, right. The senior. Also uh, to be involved in extracurricular activities, you have to have a certain amount of credits to, to be eligible for those extracurricular. Uh, to become a sophomore, you, it's based off of every five. If you're considered a sophomore, you have to have five credits, 15 uh, or five, 10, 15, sorry. Right, um, but at, the, the 12th grade year, students typically have to have um, you know, a number of credits in each of the areas. And if a, if a student is maybe not quite on track to do that, um, a parent, would, a parent could, should talk to counselor's office, the administrator, about options on how to get their student back on track for graduation. Is that correct? Okay. Because we do offer some credit recovery. Anybody want to talk about the credit recovery options that are out there? We have a couple minutes left and we're actually pretty much finished with our questions. So uh, I can talk on that. I, I do want to kind of just piggyback on that conversation too. Uh, uh, you know, especially freshmen, they have a hard time understanding that because of the difference in the junior high and the high school. Everything's based on grades here. You know, the, I guess uh, to be promoted, if there's a, a concern about grades or a star test and before they get to high school, a committee can meet and promote the child to the next grade level if that's in their best interest or they can choose to retain them. At high school, it's based on the number of credits solely that would promote them to the next grade level. And that's uh, to get a 70 or higher average in the year long class gets a credit or you know, for the semester I have credit and has 90% or better attendance rate to earn the credit. It takes both the grades and the attendance to get that. We touched on that earlier. Uh, and then for the final graduation, the, the, the uh, end of course star test comes into play. Uh, but there is no committee that can meet to promote a child at the high school level. It's all based on the number of credits they earn by a 70 or average, average or higher and the 90% attendance, at least five per year to promote to the next grade level. Right, so, so that's why. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, if, if there's a, a problem with the attendance rate being too low, which we've had a high number of that this year, uh, or if the grades are below a 70 average, they, they obviously didn't earn the credit for those classes that uh, that's the case for. Uh, so credit recovery, uh, there's different options for that. Um, if it's based solely on attendance, if they were denied credit based on attendance, um, then the kids have the opportunity to take advantage of Saturday school, Pride Hall, and some online tutorials and things like that to regain the credit if it's based just on attendance. 
if it's impacting grades as well, uh, in most cases, the students need to retake the class over again the semester. Uh, and that can be done through Edgenuity, that online platform. Uh, we've had students that have been assigned that where they worked on it on their own time outside of the school day, even mm -hmm. starting immediately if they missed their first semester credit and the grade is unrecoverable. Uh, we can assign that class now to work on their own time. It can be scheduled uh, as part of their school day. They have a credit recovery class period to work on ingenuity. Uh, summer school is another option to regain that credit, to be assigned the classwork in the summer to do over again. Or finally, in, it could be scheduled on next year's schedule again to just attend a face-to-face -face class to do it over again. So options to, to do that, but it's best just to deal with it, stay on track, earn your credit, so that we can students can take full advantage of everything that the high school has to offer all the electives all the athletic programs so I just want to clarify before we end and we're out of time we did have a question come in about the EOCs from last year and I know that is such a confusing topic if a student a freshman was in an English one or algebra one class last year um, and they passed the class then they are exempt from those EOCs moving forward. Or if a sophomore was in English two and biology, same thing, that they passed the class, then, then the state gave us a waiver to be able to exempt the students moving forward. But like Mr. Gregory was saying, that is not the case this year. Even if a student passes the class and fails the EOC, um, they will still have to take that EOC again in the future to be able to graduate. But just want to clarify that that does get to be a little confusing yeah they had to complete the credit of the class the full credit had to be completed within the 1920 school year including summer school in order to take advantage of that covid waiver for star anything before or after that time the students are accountable to passing the star test as part of their graduation right that's a good way to say it within that 1920 school year Okay, we are out of time. Thank you so much panelists for joining us and our um, attendees. We will be back at five o'clock to have a similar discussion, but we always have different questions popping in the chat. So it always changes a little bit. So please join in us, join us again, and I will see you guys in a few hours.